Hello, I'm Don Mackey. Welcome to On the Town. Today we have a guest who's familiar to just about everybody in East Longmeadow. Uh, he's been uh, served on boards and commissions for 25 years in town. Presently a member of the Planning Board, Conservation Commission, the Community Preservation Committee, the Lower Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and the East Longmeadow Garden Club. Uh, he's also, as of Late last fall, a published author, George Kingston. Welcome. Thank you. So you've written a book. Yes. Uh, about a historical figure from Somerset, Massachusetts, named James Madison Hood. Um, how did you come to pick him as a subject for your first book? First book. First book. So tell us... Uh, how you've gotten to this point? Well, it's an interesting story because um, a few years ago, I had been teaching genealogy at Minichog in the adult education program. And one of my students uh, hired me to do some work for her, uh, her father actually, because he knew that the brother of one of his ancestors had been the United States consul at Bangkok when Anna and the King of Siam was going on and was in fact mentioned in the original book, uh, The English Governors at the Court of Siam. So he wanted to know more about the rest of this gentleman's life, where he died, um, who he was married to, and whether or not he had any children. So I took on the job and dug up the information that he had asked for. And in the process of that, I posted a query on the internet on a genealogy bulletin board. Mm -hmm just asking for anyone who might have some information about James Madison Hood. And then I forgot about it for two or three years until I got an email from a woman um, in, from Somerset, Massachusetts, who turned out to be the director of the Somerset Historical Museum, who told me that she had an awful lot of information about this gentleman um, for his years in Somerset, which were the first half of his life, where he was uh, a ship captain and also a major shipbuilder. So we started corresponding. Uh, I told her the information I had about Illinois and Bangkok, which she did not have, and she gave me the information about, um, about him in Somerset. I went down and visited her, saw the stuff that they had. And after two or three years of corresponding like this, um, she one day emailed me and says, it sounds like you're writing a book. And I said, well, <laughs> yes, maybe I should. And so I decided that this gentleman's life was so interesting, it was a story that needed to be told. Mm. And so I started putting the book together and came up with what I thought was a, a good manuscript. Started trying to shop it around to agents and really didn't get very far. Uh, until another fortuitous circumstance occurred, uh, a gentleman up in Maine who writes books about clipper ships had emailed me for some information about the ships that Captain Hood had built. And I, in responding to him and giving the information, asked him if he had any suggestions about where I might get the thing, pub my book published. And he said, well, try my publisher. So I did. And they wrote back and said, we love the book, but it's too short. You need to make it uh, about a third longer. Mm -hmm. And I had all the information I needed to do that. Uh, I'm an engineer by background and training. So all of my um, training in writing has been to write succinctly, to try to get the point over in as few words as possible. So I had to do um, some expansion here and uh, overcome that, that bias in myself and put in a lot of additional information that actually helped the book. It, it fleshed it out and put a lot of um, what James Madison Hood did in context, particularly the historical context mm -hmm. of the times. Um, the, the history of, of the United States in the first half of the, the 19th century, is, is particularly the political history, is really very fascinating once you get into it. And a lot of the book, the first half of the book, is about that political history and his involvement in that. He, he was not you know, a prominent politician. He was not a governor or a president or anything like that, but he was involved at the grassroots level 
in the politics of Massachusetts yeah. uh, during that time. Fascinating story about Lincoln coming and speaking in, in, in Worcester and actually speaking in Taunton, I believe. Taunton, yes. Um, which, you know, I think growing up in Massachusetts, I don't know how many people really know that Lincoln, before he was uh, elected, yes. came and... Uh, what happened was Lincoln was a freshman congressman at the time. And he was a member of the Whig Party because the Republican Party had not yet been founded. Zachary Taylor was running for president. And he asked Lincoln to come to Massachusetts and campaign for him, basically. That's right. And of course, nobody in Massachusetts knew who Lincoln was. But he showed up at the Whig convention in Worcester. And the keynote speaker who was supposed to be there didn't show up. So they were desperate for a speaker, so they asked him to speak. And he got up and gave a speech defending the Union um, and, uh, and also an anti-slavery speech and basically brought the house down. And it was really one of his first uh, forays outside of Illinois where he was recognized as a national figure mm -hmm. by uh, another state, a party in another state. And after the convention, he then toured eastern Massachusetts. He went to Taunton, went to Fall River, a couple of other places, and gave speeches on behalf of Taylor. And Taylor won um, the, that year. So um, it was really his first, he was a congressman, but it was really his first venture into real national politics. And it's probable that Hood attended at least one of those speeches. Right. Because he was on the Whig Central Committee at that time, and um, he would, would have been at the convention. And which is as bearing on the, on the story because ultimately it's Lincoln who appointed appoints him. him, appoints right. him to uh, Right. Well, to the, real, the real connection there came in Illinois because what had happened was he had moved to Illinois as, as a land speculator, basically, and got elected to the Illinois state legislature as part of a land speculation scheme, which outlined in the book. <laughs> right. But in doing so, um, he got elected just in time to vote for Lincoln's failing bid to, to become a senator. Okay, Lincoln was defeated by Douglas, right. but Hood vi voted for Lincoln at that point. And it was that connection that eventually got him the job right. in Bangkok. So. Um, so let's just backtrack a little bit yeah. and maybe give a a rough outline because we've we've already done pretty much what Hood did is kind of jump around the world. Right. Um, so just a, kind of a brief outline of he he uh, starts in Somerset and we can start with him as a as a businessman a shipbuilder. Actually, at at 16 he's already the captain. His father gives him a, a boat to exactly to be the uh, exactly captain of. Som Somerset is a small town right across the river from Fall River. It is a deep water port even though it's up the river. And so after the War of 1812, when um, the, the British were no longer blockading, it became a major trading port for New England. And Hood's father uh, was one of those traders who traded to the Carolinas, uh, Virginia, and the Caribbean. And they would take New England products down there and bring back molasses and sugar and various tropical products um, there was a big demand for wood in the Caribbean mm -hmm. because uh, they didn't have good timber trees down there. Most of them had been cut down for the plantations. So there was a big trade of bringing lumber from Maine down to the Caribbean. And the family participated in that. And when he was, James Madison was 16 years old, he actually took over as captain of a ship. And for the rest of his life, he insisted on being called Captain Hood, even when he was a thousand miles away from the ocean. <laughs> okay, because that was his honorific title, and he felt very proud of that. Um, he thrived as a ship captain for many years, and then in the Mexican War, he was had chartered his ship to uh, transport troops and supplies right. to, um, to the American Army in Mexico, and was shipwrecked off the coast of Mexico uh, towards the end of the war. Uh, after that, he came back and started a shipyard in Massachusetts, in Somerset, just at the start of the clipper ship bubble. Now, we talked about the housing bubble today. Well, back in the 18, late 1840s, early 1850s, there was the clipper ship bubble. People had 
discover it had to make faster ships. Right. And they started building them just at the time that the gold rush was starting in California. And there was a huge demand for shipping. So everybody got into the game and started building clipper ships. Hood among them. He was one of the early ones that got into the, into the game. And he built several rather famous ones, uh, the most famous being the Raven. And uh, really thrived doing that. But then what happened was there was an oversupply of these ships. And suddenly the demand went away. And at that time, uh, he had suffered a disastrous shipyard fire, right. went bankrupt, and so decided he'd get out of the shipbuilding business. While he was a shipbuilder, he was also elected to the Massachusetts State Legislature from Somerset and uh, got involved particularly with insurance reform, which was something he was very familiar with because he had suffered at the hands of insurance companies that had gone, were insolvent, couldn't cover their, their, their losses. Right. So he was very heavily involved in insurance reform, insurance regulation reform, and also did some, uh, some work for his town in terms of getting local legislation passed. Uh, he did serve two terms there and then moved to Illinois. And the Illinois trip, uh, adventure if you will, was spurred by an acquaintance of his from the ship, shipping trade who um, had gone out there just as the Illinois Central Railroad was being driven south from Chicago uh, down to Cairo, or Cairo, I should say. And um, as it was being going down, it was opening up the interior of Illinois to farming. So there was a lot of land speculation right. going on. And he bought into an area called Loda uh, with this other gentleman from New York City, and they established a town. They then went on and decided they were going to um, create a new county. Right. And this was going to be the capital <laughs> of the county. And in the rough and tumble of Illinois uh, politics, uh, he got elected to the state legislature to try to push the scheme. But um, an interesting story, the, the book tells all about it. it they were defeated is, is what really happened. Right. And so he left Loda and moved to um, Sycamore, Illinois where he divorced his first wife, he was in his 40s now, and two days later married a 17-year-old girl. So he, um, he was a spry guy, <laughs> if you will. He, he, he had an eye for the ladies. Anyway, um, he served in the, the Illinois legislature, and after he did that, he kind of sat out the Civil War. He was really too old to enlist at that point, and he was um, known for his girth if you will. Yeah, he was portly. He was a rather portly guy. He, he wasn't the kind of guy who was going to get on a horse and ride 100 miles a day. But he decided that he would like to try to get a government job. And so he applied to, through Lincoln, for a diplomatic position. Uh, he was first offered a position in Peru, which he turned down, and then he was offered the position at Bangkok, which he accepted. Mm -hmm. So he and his young wife set off from Illinois, went to New York City, and sailed halfway around the world to Bangkok, where um, he had very little idea of what he was actually getting into. He, one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that Siam, now Thailand, was the only country in Southeast Asia that was never taken over by a Western power. Right. It was the only country that maintained its independence. Well, he arrived in Bangkok at a critical point in uh, Siamese history because the French had just conquered Indochina, which is basically Cambodia and Vietnam today, right. and were threatening to move into Thailand. The British were in Burma on the northern side and also in the southern side in what's now Malaysia and were pushing from the opposite position to dominate uh, Thailand. And so King Mangut was trying to balance these two forces. And he used the U.S. as a balancing force, a threat, if you will, to keep either side from moving in. And Hood helped orchestrate that, that, that international situation. Mm -hmm. uh, 
But the other interesting thing about his time there was that at that time the American colony in, uh, in Bangkok was sharply divided between the missionaries and the business guys. Uh, the businessmen were there to make money. They uh, were largely in shipping, but also in the rice trade. Right. They, they ran the rice mills and built the rice mills and maintained all the technology that was needed to, uh, to make the rice um, saleable. Well, uh, they were businessmen. They were intent on making money and also intent on having a good time. And so uh, they were a rather raucous group. It was kind of like the Wild West. The missionaries, on the other hand, were there to convert the Siamese to Christianity and were singularly unsuccessful in so doing because the Siamese were very happy with Buddhism. Um, it, was a, it's, it is a, a marvelous religion and did not have all the gloom and doom that these were mostly Baptists and Methodists mm -hmm. um, were, were bringing the, the Calvinist approach, if you will, to, to religion. So they most missionaries mostly just preached to themselves and uh, very few converts that they had. But they were very disapproving, of course, of the behavior of the business guys. And Hood was right in the middle between them. Um, he was, again, trying to balance two opposing forces. And in the end, ended up making both sides his enemies, which eventually drove him out of the country and uh, he returned back to the U.S. His health was also failing at that time mm -hmm. and that was a big contributor to it. Uh, the climate in the tropics did, really did not suit him uh, given that he probably had by that time developed heart problems from being overweight mm -hmm. and inactive all his life or his later part of his life. So anyway, he came back to Sycamore where he again became a civic leader was nominated, or almost nominated, I should say, for another term in the legislature, but he, he turned that down uh, largely again because of his health. Mm -hmm. And a few years later, he, he died there. So and he really led a fascinating life. I mean, one of the things I, I forgot to mention is, although I, I implied it there, is that he was one of the founders of the Republican Party. He participated in find, founding the party in Massachusetts, but the Republican Party really didn't take root in Massachusetts until after he left. But he ran as a Republican in Illinois, which is when he was a supporter of mm -hmm. Lincoln. So again, not a prominent founder, not, no one like Lincoln, but one of those grassroots soldiers of the original Republicans. So that's an interesting, there's, boy, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff uh, that, that I wanted to sort of flesh out about a number of things, and we can we can start with that. Um, and the idea, first of all, Hood as a character is is really representative of a type. There were probably, although they weren't all counsel to the court of Siam. <laughs> you know, we talk now, you know, about political operatives and how a successful politician engages people at the grassroots level, and those are really the people who sort of drive the success of a campaign. And in many ways, as I, you know, I was reading this and thinking about Hood and thinking about, you know, other people that, you know, I've come across and growing up in New England and, and hear about who aren't, aren't famous people, mm -hmm. um, but they, they have a tremendous impact. And usually that political aspect is not the defining characteristic of their lives. Um, so I just was thinking about that and Hood as an example of, of that type and where we are today with that, and I think, you know, you are sort of a representative of that type in, in East Long Meadow, and uh, I don't know, what, I mean, what's your, is there something about having looked at him as a character and found a level of interest there in this person and his accomplishments that, that either sets him apart or, or that you would say makes him representative of type? And, and, how would you compare that to today? Are there, do, are there people like Hood out there today that sort of would stand out? There, there, are, there are lots of people uh, like him today. I think one of the things that, that made him most interesting to me, so interesting to me, was the fact that he wasn't one-dimensional. He was involved in so many different things. He was a, a, a captain. He, was, he built ships. He 
was a legislature in two very different legislatures. Massachusetts mm -hmm. and Illinois were uh, night and day when it came to uh, the way the legislature ran. For instance, in Massachusetts, they met every year, and they only met for like four months. In Illinois, they only met every other year. They had so little <laughs> business to do that they only met every other year. And, uh, you know, but when you look at the way legislators were elected back then and the way they're elected today, I think one of the big differences is that back then you didn't have as many professional politicians, if you will. Exactly. Um, you know, you didn't have an Ed Markey who was in the legislature, U.S. legislature for 37 years. There were a few. Stephen Douglas certainly was a professional politician. It was mostly what he did. But at the local level, these were typically civic leaders who were um, important economically in, their, uh, in their, their town and who were sent really as the representatives of the town. They were there primarily to make sure that their town got its fair share of whatever was, was going on and that whatever local business needed to be transacted in the legislature got transacted. It was interesting that back then, almost everything a town wanted to do had to be approved by the state legislature. Right. Okay. Uh, I mentioned in here, for instance, if they wanted to set up a police court or a fire department, that had to be approved by the legislature. Uh, if they, in, in one case here, they wanted to get a small piece of land from an adjacent town so they could build a bridge, that had to be approved right. by the legislature. Right. Anybody who wanted to set up a corporation had to have the corporation approved specifically by the legislature. There was no general corporate law like there is today. So if, um, if I was in, in Somerset and I wanted to set up a, uh, a wire mill, let's say, and I wanted to incorporate it, I would have to go to my legislator and say, could you please put a bill in to set up my corporation? Well, Hood was the biggest employer in Somerset with his um, shipyard, mm -hmm. and he had a big economic influence on all the suppliers to that shipyard. And so they chose him to go to Boston to actually represent them. And when he came home and, and, and met with them, I mean, everybody knew him. Right. You know, it was, it was uh, somewhat different from today where Yes, the local legislators that we send to Boston do know a lot of people in the towns, but they represent a much bigger population and are, tend to be more focused on statewide issues than, than local than issues. Local issues. Yeah. There was just as, as an aside, and again, I'm thinking about this and um, happened to see an interview the other night on the news hour with two people who written a book, and I'm sorry, I meant to research the title so I could name the title, but the premise of their book is that the shift is moving back toward uh, really cities mm -hmm. and, and sort of urban um, areas and surrounding towns, but that mayors and business leaders, employers, um, civic groups, are really forced by the absolute inability of Washington to accomplish anything, uh, and the dr and the fact that the money's dried up to yeah. some degree, to really go back to the business of hammering out solutions on their own, um, and the, the the interview conveyed that the, the authors see this as a as a good thing, as a good sign that we're sort of allowing people or maybe forcing people to get back to. Um, more civic engagement at the local level and, and a recognition of the power that people do have, which is a message that, you know, can't hurt to spread here in town. <laughs> well, I, I, I agree with that. And it's interesting that, um, particularly at, at the local level in, in, in the towns like here and in Longmeadow, you find that the, uh, the select people and so on tend to be um, business people or people who are otherwise engaged heavily in the towns. But you go to the cities and, and the mayors tend to be 
mostly politicians, I mean mm -hmm. professional politicians. And when you look at the state legislature, you find you don't see a lot of prominent business people in the state legislature. Okay, you find people who are focused more on the political aspects of, of things. And part of that is it's harder to get elected because you really have to understand politics to get elected. Right. And part of it is that people who are successful in business don't see the upside of getting involved in politics. Uh, there really isn't, a, you know, if you're running a, a multi-million dollar corporation, why would you take a job as a legislator at 100000 a year, you know, or whatever they get, right. um, and, and have to spend your time dealing with people um, that where you're always trying to compromise and everything else when you, you can run your own company. Right, and do things the way you want. Want, want to yeah. a certain extent. Um, so the incentive is not there. Uh, the incentive is for business leaders to um, try to influence politicians rather than to go in and do the job themselves. Yeah, which, you know, is, leads to a word that starts with capital M, and, and then I think that, uh, yes. you know, is there, is there an alternative? I, mean, I think everybody sort of imagines that there, that there is an alternative. I don't know. I mean, if, that, if, the, if the sort of lack of incentive for a business person who's, you know, busy, yeah. um, to say, well, you know, I'd really like things to be a different way, but I don't have time or the inclination to go and do it myself. If that, you know, is for the sort of residential property owner who wants to take his two weeks of vacation every year and go to the ball game, mm -hmm. um, is there an incentive to run for selectman or planning board or, you know, it, it's, the thinking maybe is similar there in terms of what's the upside. <laughs> yeah. So what is the upside, George, well, of, of the, being a the citizen legislator? Because the, you've, like, yeah. you've done it. I mean, the, the upside of getting involved with uh, particularly town government is that you really can have an influence on what happens in the town, on the direction the town takes. And if you listen to the residents of the town, hopefully the direction that you drive it in is the direction that people want it to drive in. I mean, I, I've been involved with a number of things um, in, in terms particularly of uh, quality of life in town, the tattoo parlor issue, um, we're going to be dealing with medical marijuana issues mm -hmm. um, because the state says, you know, you have to deal with that. We're looking at the impact of casinos on the town. And I think that all of those things are really important and that people need to get engaged on them. The other upside is you begin to understand how things really work in town government and also in state government. And that gives you the ability then to influence things um, and also to realize the things that you can't change. Um, and one, I mean, the amount of legislation that towns um, suffer under is, is, is immense. The, the, the limitations on what towns and, and boards can and cannot do is incredible. And I, I find there's a lot of misinformation out there about what people think we can do, say, on planning board. Right. Okay, um, really we're very limited in terms of, of what our powers are. So we have to work around that and um, work to make changes where possible through town meeting, for instance. And one of the things that we have to do there is to educate people about what it is we're proposing and why we're proposing it that way. Because uh, that hasn't changed any in the last 200 years. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, the other thing yeah. I wanted, and this sort of jumps away a little bit, but to get back to the book and yeah. the story um, is the role of the role of the press, and, and one of the things that's always intriguing to me is to, and I don't watch a lot of cable news yes. shows, but you know the, the sort of acrimony that that one hears between the participants of these programs that you know certainly drives ratings, um, and a lot of discussion by the politicians who just are always whining about how nasty the tone is. You go back and you read some of these things that were published in the 1800s about political enemies, and 
I oh, mean, yes. they took the gloves off. Oh, yes. And it's, um, I don't think that the nature of political discourse has changed really one iota in, in 200 years. I mean, people can be mean-spirited. They can do what they need to do to get what they want. And uh, I don't think that fundamentally has changed at I all. I don't think that's changed <laughs> since ancient Greece. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, Pericles had the same problems. Um, except he didn't have TV back then, right? You know, and and in the 19th century they didn't have TV, they didn't have radio, they had newspapers, and every newspaper had a distinct political slant, and they did not mind at all name calling, right, and uh, saying really nasty things about their opponents and interpreting. Uh, in doing the book, it was fascinating to be reading some of the speeches uh, that were given. This was, this was in the late 1850s when the Kansas-Nebraska issue was up, right. and it was dividing the country. It was an anti-slavery issue, pro-slavery issue. People were giving speeches on this all the time, and you'd read about a speech in two different newspapers, one that was pro and one that was con, and it wouldn't sound like they were reporting on the, the same, same speech. speech. Yeah. And it's just exactly what you hear on TV today. Exactly. Okay, yep. this, the same thing, um, and they weren't afraid to put it in print you know, for, for the ages. One of the things that, that made the book fun to do was the ability nowadays to go onto the internet and read old newspapers, uh, you know, actual uh, photographs, if you will, of the original pages, pages right. which are indexed electronically. So you can go and read uh, the Fitchburg Union or whatever uh, from 1852 and go through there and get all the references to slavery, if you will, or, or to Lincoln or whatever. And, and this stuff, when I was growing up you know, in, in school, if you wanted to do that kind of research, you had to go to the New York Public Library. Exactly. They would order the newspapers from the archives, which were eight blocks away. So you'd come back the next day and have to go through page by page these dusty piles of newsprint. Yep. Now you can sit at your computer and get all this stuff. Uh, in some ways, it can be overwhelming because of the amount that's available, but you can actually get back to the original sources. And, and that was one of the things that made writing the book such fun, was actually being able to go back and read the original sources rather than another historian's take on things, you know, having sorted through it. And, right. and in fact, one of the, the really fascinating things about the book was, um, one of the missionaries, um, James Beach Bradley, mm -hmm. was prominently involved with, with Hood. He, he, and he was one of the, the people that first liked Hood and then didn't like Hood. His grandson wrote a book based on his diaries. And the book was called Siam Then, and I reference it in here. Um, and I read that book, I got a copy of it actually, and it gave me a certain picture of Dan Beach Bradley. Then I went out to Wesleyan University in Ohio mm -hmm. and looked at the original diaries, which are, they, they maintain, and they were marked up in red. And I could tell that those were the markings that his grandson had put in there. And when you looked at what he included and what he didn't include, <laughs> You could tell. I mean, you know, it's his ancestor. He's trying to make the guy look good. Right. And so he was very selective in what he put in there. When you look at the totality of the diaries, you, you find a much more complex individual who was a really good person, but who had a lot of self-doubt, and who was also, in some senses, a pompous person who felt that he was absolutely right all the time, that God was on his side, and anyone who opposed him was siding with the devil, mm -hmm. okay? Um, which didn't come out, of course, in the biography of him. But it, it <laughs> really helped me understand the interaction between him and Hood in the critical trial that Hood held right. uh, relative to the French consul uh, general in, in, in Siam that helped to defuse this British-French uh, confrontation, if you will. So, um, yeah, it, it, reading the original sources really is, is fascinating, I find. It, it's 
uh, it takes time and interpretation. Now, you also did a little traveling. Uh, you went to Illinois. I went to Illinois. Went, went to Somerset several times. Didn't went go to, to Bangkok. Didn't go to Bangkok yet. Depends <laughs> on how well the book sells. <laughs> <laughs> but um, no, we did go out to Illinois and uh, visited the places where Hood had lived in Illinois, mm -hmm. both Sycamore, Loda. Went to the Lincoln Library out there and um, really got a sense of the place. It, it must have been devastating for his, his young wife um, to go out there with him. Can't uh, imagine. You know, and, and land in this, quote, town that consisted of a hotel and a couple of grain silos in the middle of absolutely nowhere. And even today, if you go out there, once you get outside the, the boundaries of these little towns, it's nothing but corn, flat. And, and corn as far as you can see. And of course, back then it wasn't corn, it was just grass. Right. Okay, uh, very, you know, uh, different from what we see here on the East Coast. And of course, the winters out there, I, I lived in Ohio for four years. The winters in the Midwest can be absolutely devastating. And you can imagine living in an isolated farmhouse in January when the blizzards come in in Illinois. Uh, you, you don't go anywhere, you're, you're stuck. <laughs> So, you know, it, it, it was a big change from, from here, but he had really high hopes and actually did succeed quite well in business in Illinois. Mm -hmm. He, you know, one of the things that growing up in the, the East Coast uh, maritime trade teaches you is how to be a good business guy. Yeah. Because um, the, these people didn't just sail the ships. They bought the cargoes, they sailed the ship, they chose the port they were going to go to to sell it at. They sold the cargoes. They bought new cargoes. When they were really merchants, right. not, just, not just captains. Shippers, right. And it trained them in negotiation and in buying and selling and, and doing the art, of, the art of the deal, if you will. And that benefited him for the rest of his life. Um, briefly, the, the time that he was there, um, speaking of sort of cloudy histories, I guess, yeah. is uh, Anna Leon Owens, yes. who was the uh, employed by the king to teach English to his children and, and people in the court. Um, and she is the subject of the couple of books mm -hmm. um, and then the famous movie movie and the <laughs> and play, play yes. that was on Broadway for so many yes. years. And, and Again, some sort of liberties taken with the facts and yes. representation of, of who she was and what her role was. Um, but out of that, just to, to go back to the king and the, and the, and the political situation in Thailand, um, that Mangut was a, was a, a very progressive, uh, and I think some of this is what sort of at odds in some of what was, was written about him, that he, he really was a sort of a Western-oriented individual, as I take it from, from reading the book, and, and was intent on maintaining that independence and teaching his family and court English and looking at progressive reforms in that country. Um, that he was not the sort of Yul Brenner character. Oh, ab absol absolutely <laughs> not. So um, I th just wanted to sort yeah. of let that, hash yeah. that out, because you don't really address it directly in the book, but it's, I think it's, yeah. uh, people uh, have this kind of romantic idea of well, you know, the, the what whole, it must have been like. The whole Anna Leon Owens thing is, is fascinating. Um, her, her, her own life is, is a myth, if you will, right. uh, largely created by herself, um, but she was not just you know, a governess, if you will. She was actually a confidential secretary to the king. She did handled all of his French and English correspondence. Okay? He, she would translate from uh, Siamese into, mm -hmm. uh, into French and English uh, so that his correspondence was polished and, and so on. Um, and, and the king himself was very heavily involved in negotiations, not just with France and England, but within the country. The internal politics of Thailand were very complex at the time. Um, there were different factions that were going one against the other. 
uh, it's probable that um, Anna was in fact the, the, the leaker, if you will, um, as we would say today, <laughs> um, the, the source of Bradley's um, confidential information that he was printing in his newspaper, which caused uh, the, the trial that, that we talk about in the right. book. Um, so she, she was definitely supporting the British faction in the British versus French and using Bradley as a, um, an unwitting agent, if you will, to, uh, to press the, the British claims versus, versus the French claims. Uh, so she was, again, a complex person herself. Uh, Manga himself was um, very, he modernized the, uh, the Siamese army and navy. Uh, he did put in a lot of reforms. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating was he hired a lot of Westerners to, uh, to run his government. Uh, the inspector of customs was an American. Okay. Uh, the various court functionaries were either British, American, or huh. French. So that you know, he, was, he was bringing um, this expertise to those parts of the government that, um, in, that, that interacted with Western powers. Hmm. So a lot of the trade was carried out uh, by Western ships. Um, there's also a lot of trade with China, with Chinese ships, but most, a lot of the major trade was through Western ships. So his inspector of customs, the um, people who controlled the ports, tended to be Westerners because they could deal with the captains. Um, his, uh, he did have, of course, a lot of, a lot of his, his countrymen in the government as well, particularly for the internal government of the country. Right. Yeah. But I was just amazed at how many Westerners had relatively high positions. The other thing that, that, that is amazing is that he, he was very open to interaction with Westerners, that the Western community could stroll into the, the, the uh, palace any time, and if he was around, he'd, he'd stop and talk with them. <laughs> Whereas if you were a Siamese and he came along, you were supposed to bow down and not look at him. Right. Okay, so uh, you know, a very different interaction with Westerners, and I think largely because he was trying to bring his country up to speed quickly so that he could maintain the independence of the right. country. Right. And he was successful in that. Interesting. Yeah. So what's your next project? Oh, my next one's an, another interesting one. I'm, I'm working on a joint biography of two men, uh, the architect and the engineer who built the Chrysler building. Oh, wonderful story. Oh, that's great. Well, what's really interesting about this one is that the builder of the Chrysler building was from Springfield. He was Fred T. Lay. Uh, if you know of Lay Fred Terrace, he built yeah. that. But um, he started, he, he dropped out of high school and went to work for the, the city of Springfield in their engineering department and helped build the Springfield Suburban Railroad, uh, Street Railroad. Mm -hmm. And from that, he branched out into uh, building all kinds of things. He built the Coliseum at the uh, Big E. Really? He built Fort Devens at World, in World War I. And then he went on to build numerous buildings in New York City, including the Chrysler Building. Wow, fascinating. The architect of the building, uh, Van Allen, was uh, from, from Brooklyn. He was also a self-made man who uh, won a prestigious prize to go study architecture in, in uh, France and um, was actually hired by someone, uh, I forget the name of the guy now, I'd have to go back and look at my notes, to design a building for the Chrysler Building site. Walter Chrysler came in and bought the site. And when he bought the site, he told Van Allen, you're still the architect, mm. and, but I want the building to be taller. And so they redesigned the building as it was being built. And um, Van Allen, unfortunately, did not sign a contract with Walter Chrysler. And so after the building was built, uh, Chrysler offered him a certain amount of money for his work, and he said no. He said, you know, architects typically get this percentage of the cost of the building. And Chrysler said, no, I'm gonna pay you what I think you're worth, and it's this. And he sued Chrysler, and he never got another major commission again. <laughs> so don't sue your no, <laughs> employers. Well. 
But if it's Walter Chrysler, if it's Walter Chrysler, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's a fascinating uh, story, and and again, another fascinating time, certainly that in in American history and the history of architecture and oh yeah, and the you know the number of geniuses that were running around building great buildings, and it's just uh, that's a great that's a cool story. And, and what got, so what got you onto that? Well, I was at uh, a Pioneer Valley Planning Commission annual meeting at which someone was talking, giving a, a speech, you know, about the great things that, uh, that have happened in the Pioneer Valley. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone, I, I still can't remember who it was, somebody got up and said, yeah, you know, nobody ever remembers that the builder of the Chrysler Building came from Springfield. And that just struck me. So I started looking into it. And again, uh, turned out to be an absolutely fascinating individual um, he and his brothers were into all kinds of weird stuff, but you know he was a very, very successful builder. And again, his success was built on the art of the deal. It yep. was how do you get the contract and then how do you build and make a profit? And one of the things that he built his reputation on was coming in on budget, on time. And he knew how, he learned how to organize large forces of men to build things rapidly and well, which is what he did for Fort Devens. Um, there's a whole story there that Wilson got Congress to declare war on Germany in April of 1917. When he did that, there was no infrastructure for training the troops. They, if they had drafted the men they needed that day, there was no place to send them. It took two months for them to decide where they were going to build the first camps. And one of them almost got built in East Long Meadow. Really? Yeah. But the Fort Devens location was eventually chosen instead mm. because of its location on the railroads. And he was given a cost plus contract to go out and build that camp in three months, and he did it. Hmm. And it was ready when the first draftees showed up in September. Wow. But, and, and that was just amazing, but what, what really struck me about this is, as you know, when World War I broke out in 1914, I believe, um, the, European, the reason it broke out was largely that the European powers were able to mobilize their armies within days and get them to the front. When the U.S. declared war, it was unable to send, except for a few regular army troops who went over almost immediately, or actually in July, yeah. it did not accept its first trainees for the citizen army until September, okay? That's like five months. You know, had, had we actually been threatened, <laughs> as opposed to sending people across, across the, ocean, the ocean, we yeah. would have been toast. Yeah. You know, there was no infrastructure for dealing right. with this. So, you know, the, these, these currents of history that, that catch people up, and then yep. how they, they deal with them, um, and that's what the Hood Book is all about. Right. Is he's in the currents of American history, and he's dealing with these changes, the political change, the economic changes, the ups and downs of the economy throughout that period and how he, he survived and, and thrived and floated through that and, and did what he did. Um, Fred Lay was the same thing. He yeah. moved with the times. He learned how to build steel frame buildings when it was a completely new art yeah. and learned how to do that successfully and profitably and made a ton of money doing it and made, built, built some very beautiful and very um, impressive buildings many of which, like the Coliseum, are still in use. Yes. Okay. Uh, when we see uh, buildings that are, are built 30 years ago are now, well, they're obsolete because they're only yeah. they're 30 years old, you yeah. know? So, like the Chrysler building is, will be there probably forever, forever. you know? Yeah. I just uh, remember when I was in college, um, and at, at one point in the city of New York, uh, the Chrysler building had, had fallen into Disrepair. I know a lot of the metal, you know, decorative work at the at the top was coming off, and I don't know who owned it. If it was, but it had mm. was pretty much in tough shape. 
And in the New York Times, over a period of a week, they published a series of advertisements about the renaissance of the Chrysler building coming back. And on the first day, it was a full page ad that was entirely white, except for the very tip of the spire at the bottom of the page. And over the five days, the building rose in the image. And I, I saved those. I still have them. And it was just a, a great thing to get the New York Times and open it up and see. <laughs> yes. So it's always been a favorite building of mine. But yes. Yeah, that, that, that's a very appropriate ad because not too many people remember this, but when the Chrysler building was being built, it was in competition with another building more southerly in Manhattan, for which it was going to be the tallest. And Chrysler kept his designs under wraps. And after the building was just about complete, they built another, I think it was a six or ten story spire inside the building. Right. And one day, they just oh, rose it up there. through the top <laughs> yeah. to get those extra feet. Yeah. And of course, the next year, the Empire State Building was, was, was finished and, yeah. and they were second place. But <laughs> That's a wonderful, it's a, it's a, they're all wonderful stories. Oh, yes. Uh, we look forward to that book. Well, You'll good. to come back and uh, talk about that one. We will. Well, we thanks will. so much for coming. And well, thanks for having been me. A treat. It's fun to talk about it. All right. So, again, the title of the book is James Madison Hood, Lincoln's Consul to the Court of Siam. It's published by McFarland and Company. It's available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble electronically. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, we will see you next time. Okay. <laughs>